welcome back. I'm Neil Barkovan, and this is episode four of Paleo Human Mysteries. You remember Hobbes, my saber toothed cat and wingman. Well, let me introduce you to another VIP around here. This is Cal, a Neanderthal friend of ours, and her skull, it does appear that it's a 50,000 year old female. Anyway, her skull is based on the first discovery of adult Neanderthal bones, ones found in Gibraltar in 1848. If the Gibraltar bones had been recognized for what they were, well, everything could have turned out so differently. We'd likely be calling Neanderthals Calpacans, according to Rebecca Sykes in her wonderful book, Kindred. So we'd have commercials saying, it's so easy a Calpacan could do it. Seriously, we apologize. We had no idea you guys were still around. Yeah, next time maybe do a little research. <laughs> it just doesn't have the right ring to it. The very first discovery of Neanderthal bones in general were of a child's skull found in Belgium in 1829 in the Awears Cave. By the way, that's 27 years before the Neanderthal bones were found in Germany where they got their name. We'll get to that in a minute. So if these very first bones, the child's skull, had been recognized as different from ours, we'd be calling Neanderthals Awerians. And researchers would have recently determined that most of us are 2% Awerian. That doesn't sound right either. All right, so how did Neanderthals get their name? Well, Joachim Neander was a German theologian in the mid-1600s, and although he died at the very early age of 25 from tuberculosis, he composed more than 40 hymns for the church. Some of the hymns like, Praise to the Lord, the Almighty. Are still popular in churches today. The people loved him, so they named a valley after him. And in German, a valley is a tall. So it was Neanderthal. Well, 200 years later, workers were digging in the valley in a limestone quarry and they came across some oddly shaped human bones. For instance, there were huge brow ridges. The nasal opening was much bigger. The skull was elongated and there was no real chin. The leg bones they found were much thicker and slightly bowed. Today, it'd be difficult to imagine scientists overlooking such obvious differences between our bones and Neanderthals. But in the mid 1800s, virtually no one had an inkling that there had been other humans around besides us. You know, there are known knowns and known unknowns. Well, this is one of those unknown unknowns that people talk about. In 1848, scientists lacked the context with which to evaluate such unusual bones. Darwin was still working on his soon to be published Origin of the Species, and Victorian scientists were only slowly coming on board to Charles Lyell's 1833 work, Principles of Geology, which talked about the Earth's history and the fossil record being much older than the traditional 6,000 years asserted through some biblical studies. Well, researchers came to look at the bones, and one of those was Rudolf Virchow, who's considered the father of pathology. That's the study of diseases. He's been awarded that title because he wrote more than 2,000 papers on the topic. Well, he, of course, explained the weird bones from his frame of reference, saying they were obviously from a deformed Cossack horseman who suffered from rickets and the pain of the disease caused him to frown and squint, causing his enlarged eyebrow ridges. One quick story about Virchow, amazing stuff. He was a social reformer and Chancellor Otto von Bismarck hated him. Hated him so much that he challenged him to a duel. As the challenged party, Virchow got to choose the weapons and he chose, drum roll, sausages. One sausage was to be pure and clean, and the other was loaded with parasites. Bismarck subsequently withdrew his challenge. Okay, back to the Neanderthal bones. Luckily, 
Darwin's On the Origin of the Species was published shortly after the Neander Valley bones were found, and people for the first time realized we might not have been the only human species on the planet. Wow, think about what a paradigm shift that was. For thousands of years, we've considered ourselves the only human species ever. And now, evidence was indicating we weren't that special. By the way, I've just been reading The Last Human, which is a guide to 22 other species of now extinct humans. The two authors are definitely splitters, not lumpers. And there are definitely some very good anthropologists out there who would lump most or all those into one species. But that's a topic for another day. In any case, it was mind-blowing to consider that we weren't always alone in the world. Well, researchers started discussing what to call them, and one of the leading suggestions was Homo stupidus. That is really condescending. Which I think says a lot about the arrogance of Homo sapiens. Fortunately, a geologist, one of my people, William King, suggested the name Homo neanderthalensis, and they settled on that. Well, that's a pretty cool story by itself, but here's the part that sends chills down my spine. The ancient Greek translation of Neander's name means new man. So unknowingly, they named these Valley of the New Man. How ironic, how amazing, how cool is that? Well, before I close, let me make a few comments about my books. My first novel, Mach 2 and the Mammoth People, was published by Rare Bird Books in 2019. The sequel, The People Eaters, is due out this June of 2022. Let me just start by saying that even though these books are fiction, they're based on the best and most up-to-date research out there. Each one starts with a brief author's note that talks about the science behind the story, and those notes tie to more than 200 annotated references at the back that further document the authenticity and factual nature of these books. So the science is ultra important to me. But I don't want you to get the idea that these are science books. They're both great, fun reads, filled with action and adventure, sex and violence, drama and love stories, all the good stuff. I've always found that if I could learn something while enjoying a fascinating and exciting story, well, that's the best of historical fiction. The books are set in Paleolithic Italy 45,000 years ago, Mach 2 is a young Homo sapiens man who finds himself fighting for leadership of his tribe and the right to mate Nuri, a beautiful, talented, and fiercely independent female. She's also being courted by Mach 2's rival, the handsome, shrewd, and cunning Jabil. Mach 2 and his people have confrontations with the Pale Ones, a fearsome group of Neanderthals, also known as the People Eaters, because they may be cannibals. But Mach 2 is able to observe these human-like creatures from afar, and he wonders about their nature. Are they always going to be a threat to his tribe? Finding out may get Mach 2 killed and eaten, a terrifying reality that he's forced to face when he's captured by a tribe of Neanderthals called the Krog. What happens next challenges everything that Mach 2 knows about himself, his people, and his world. Now, you're not expecting a spoiler alert from the author, are you? The People Eaters carries on the story, and it starts explosively as Nuri is captured by the Shiv, a different group of clearly cannibalistic Neanderthals. Without giving too much away, Nuri shows just how strong her spirit is as she faces unimaginable hardships. Besides the great literary reviews, I've been especially pleased to see 
that reviewers and readers have recognized how thoroughly based in science the story is. And I've been blown away by the positive reviews that both novels are getting. Check out these unbiased Amazon buying reviews. They're averaging 4.7 stars out of 5. Many are comparing the books to those of Jean All, who, by the way, has sent me a letter saying she was pleased by the books. She's been very supportive, and she'll always be an inspiration. Even top-level anthropologists. That's been one of the perks of all this research. I've been fortunate to connect with some of the leading archaeologists and other scientific experts in related fields. Their guidance and encouragement has been really invaluable. I've also written a related children's science book, When We Met Neanderthals. It's been strongly endorsed by the head of the anthropology department at Texas A&M. It's a colorful picture story of what may have happened when we met up with this other human species so long ago. Almost every page has a science corner fact and picture, like the oldest musical instrument ever found, a 40,000-year-old vulture bone flute. It's got saber-toothed cats and mammoths and woolly rhinos and volcanoes, and kids are loving it. Well, I want to thank you for watching my video series. I love talking about this, as you can probably tell, and I hope you found it interesting. Please follow me on Facebook at Author Neil Bakoven to continue to learn more about paleo-human mysteries. Thanks.